Bonjour, avec Jean Tirole, nous avons le plaisir de vous inviter et de vous accueillir pour ce premier sommet « Sauver le bien commun ». C'est une coproduction qui est faite donc avec l'École d'économie de Toulouse, que vous avez longtemps animé, Jean Tirole, avec Challenge, le bien commun, ça nous va bien, notre raison d'être, elle est signée chaque semaine, l'économie de demain, c'est l'affaire de tous, et puis avec également les écoles parisiens événements qui ont organisé cette, euh, grande, euh, ce grand plateau et qui nous accueillent dans leur studio parce que oui, Jean, nous ne sommes pas à Toulouse, nous ne sommes pas dans un amphi de TSE. Est-ce qu'il y a un peu de regret chez vous oh, C'est dommage, mais enfin, nous avons un très, très beau programme. Et puis la prochaine fois, ça sera à Toulouse de toute façon. En tout cas, vous nous avez apporté le soleil, même si on ne le voit pas dans ce studio. Alors, un mot peut-être, Jean pour expliquer ce qu'est cette notion du bien commun que, euh, dont vous êtes un ardent promoteur en France, en, en quelques phrases, qu'est-ce que c'est le bien commun Alors le bien commun, ça réfère à une question qui est très simple. Dans quelle société aimerions-nous vivre euh, Donc euh, c'est plus compliqué que ça n'en paraît, parce que en fait, nous avons tous notre place dans la société, nous avons tous un vécu, des préjugés et des incitations. Et donc ces incitations peuvent aller à l'encontre effectivement du bien commun parce qu'on va rechercher nos intérêts propres. Et le, la doctrine des philosophes, ou de certains philosophes au moins, c'est de regarder derrière le voile d'ignorance, c'est-à-dire se dire, là, si je n'étais pas né, je ne sais pas quel serait mon genre, ma, ma position dans la société, ma religion, mon pays, euh, mon éducation. Et donc quel genre de société je voudrais avoir Et on peut tirer pas mal de conséquences de cette petite question tant en économie qu'en sciences politiques et en droit, euh, sur dans quelle société nous voudrions vivre. Alors on va en parler pendant deux jours, on va voir comment sauver ce, ce bien commun qui est mis à mal. Il y a, outre vous, euh, cinq autres prix Nobel, vous serez trois euh, dans, dans un instant. Et puis il y a les meilleurs des économistes des grandes institutions mondiales, euh, MIT, Harvard, Princeton. Et nous avons euh, imaginé aussi, avec les chercheurs de euh, TSE, un nouveau format qui est, euh, quand la recherche euh, rencontre le terrain, le terrain ce sera des, des grands chefs d'entreprise. Enfin, avec, euh, on a ce souci constant, que ce soit TSE, que ce soit challenge de faire, d'utiliser, j'utilise cette belle expression qui est à vous, déchirer le voile d'ignorance. Et pour commencer à déchirer le voile d'ignorance et introduire ce sommet, nous avons, Jean, une keynote assez inhabituelle, celle du président de la République. Bonjour à toutes et tous. Nous n'avons pas attendu la pandémie pour prendre conscience des, des failles grandissantes de notre système économique. Certes, il a sorti des centaines de millions de personnes de la pauvreté, mais il s'avère au mieux impuissant, au pire nocif, face aux défis de notre temps. La menace climatique, la montée des inégalités au sein de nos sociétés, conduisant d'ailleurs elles-mêmes à, à une crise démocratique que nous voyons euh, évoluer, les évolutions démographiques, les révolutions technologiques. Très clairement, une réforme en profondeur est indispensable pour euh, le système qui a prévalu durant ces dernières décennies. Le consensus de Washington a vécu. Ne soyons pas ingrats, il a été fécond dans le contexte historique du siècle dernier. Mais nous avons laissé le capitalisme se déployer sans garde-fou, nous l'avons laissé se dévoyer, trop dérégulé, trop court-termiste, et il est, ce faisant, parfois devenu fou. Ce schéma de pensée n'est plus adapté aux défis actuels, car il ne prend pas assez en compte les biens communs, comme la préservation de la planète ou la justice sociale. C'est-à-dire ce qui sous-tend la possibilité même pour notre humanité de poursuivre son chemin et la possibilité même pour nos sociétés et nos nations de vivre ensemble. La pandémie mondiale que nous connaissons a rendu la crise de nos systèmes économiques encore plus flagrante. Aux États-Unis, elle a montré les dégâts d'une protection sociale lacunaire qui s'accommode d'inégalités grandissantes et de tous ordres. Pour l'Union européenne, elle a montré les dégâts d'une politique de recherche et d'innovation trop peu ambitieuse, pas assez entreprenante. Nous devons donc bâtir un nouveau consensus fondé sur l'économie sociale de marché et qui fasse de la poursuite des biens communs la boussole de nos décisions. D'autres modèles de société prospèrent. Nous devons prouver que le modèle de démocratie libérale est capable d'affronter les défis qui nous font face. Car oui, ce qui est devant nous, c'est un défi 
d'efficacité de nos démocraties libérales, c'est-à-dire leur capacité à réarticuler un consensus nouveau qui soit conforme à nos valeurs et à l'universalisme de celles-ci et qui soit efficace face aux grandes transformations et aux chocs et ruptures que nos sociétés vont continuer de connaître. C'est-à-dire, au fond, le consensus qui permettra en acte de préparer à notre résilience collective, comme on l'emploie souvent le terme. Mais c'est bien cela dont il s'agit. Pourquoi je crois très profondément que c'est un critère d'efficacité qui doit présider à nos travaux En quoi et comment nous réglons efficacement le problème d'une croissance qui permette l'innovation, la justice sociale et le règlement du sujet climatique, entre autres choses. La définition de ce cap commun doit être l'occasion de raffermir nos méthodes d'action. Il faut d'abord réhabiliter l'action multilatérale. La gestion de la crise épidémique a été comme un cas d'école qui a illustré avec éclat l'efficacité et l'approche coopérative qui a aussi révélé cruellement les impasses d'approche unilatérale. Il faut aussi réhabiliter la voie de la science, notamment des sciences sociales. L'objectivité, la rationalité doivent revenir dans le débat public. Les diagnostics empiriques qui établissent les données et les faits, le travail théorique et conceptuel aussi qui éclaire et oriente, posent des cadres et des repères. À cet égard, je veux saluer le thème de ce sommet, sauver le bien commun. Oui, les économistes doivent réinvestir les grandes questions. Il faut réinterroger nos dogmes, sortir de nos habitudes en tirant de la crise des enseignements pour ce siècle. Les cinq thèmes que vous avez choisis sont à mes yeux structurants de ce nouveau consensus. Les inégalités d'abord, je viens de l'évoquer. Nous savions déjà toute l'importance des dispositifs de solidarité sociale, mais la crise nous a apporté des preuves nouvelles, parfois cruelles. Certains pays notamment anglo-saxons, ont dû pallier les déficiences structurelles de leur système à grand renfort de mesures ponctuelles. Aux États-Unis, la nouvelle administration a pris conscience de ces avaries. Les réformes annoncées depuis le début de l'année vont d'ailleurs permettre au modèle américain de converger vers le nôtre. Leur niveau de fiscalité augmente pour se rapprocher de celui de l'Europe. Leur protection sociale s'enrichit de quelques-uns des droits qui font depuis longtemps l'honneur de la France, comme l'école maternelle gratuite ou les aides à la petite enfance. Il faut poursuivre cette convergence vers le haut. C'est pour cela que je promeux depuis 2017 un accord le plus ambitieux possible à l'OCDE pour une fiscalité juste et robuste des entreprises multinationales. D'abord pour corriger des biais et en quelque sorte un dumping fiscal de ce secteur et de ces acteurs, aussi pour financer de manière soutenable des modèles sociaux plus ambitieux. En Europe en général et en France en particulier, nous avons éprouvé notre capacité de résistance, mais notre système lui-même est loin d'être parfait. Cela fait plus de 40 ans qu'il lutte, comme il le peut, contre les inégalités d'opportunité. Ne cédons pas à l'illusion facile de croire que la redistribution ex post suffit. La France en est d'ailleurs un parfait exemple. Nous sommes sans doute l'un des pays de l'OCDE qui répare le plus les inégalités par sa fiscalité et l'ensemble de ses aides et de ses dispositifs de soutien. Mais la clé pour des sociétés justes, la clé pour recimenter en quelque sorte nos sociétés, nos nations, retrouver ce qui fait que nous vivons ensemble, c'est de prévenir ces inégalités, c'est de déconstruire ce qui les forge dans le destin d'une vie. Et donc, c'est de déployer une action de fond pour l'égalité d'accès aux opportunités, les chemins de la réussite dans toutes ces dimensions, la mobilité sociale en somme. C'est tout le travail que nous faisons dès les premiers jours de l'existence, avec la mission sur les mille premiers jours que nous avions confié à Boris Cyrulnik et une commission, l'investissement dans la formation des parents, dans tout ce temps justement pour former nos enfants, les aider, les soutenir, y compris affectivement. C'est tout l'investissement fait dans l'école dès le plus jeune âge. C'est tout l'investissement fait dans l'instruction, la formation, qui sont des objectifs fondamentaux de notre politique, des valeurs qui ne sont peut-être pas directement monétaires, mais qui sont la clé sans lesquelles une société ne peut que se déliter. C'est surtout la clé d'une société qui corrige les inégalités de départ, celles qui naissent dans la famille, et qui permet de prévenir les inégalités du destin de vie plutôt que de les corriger ex post. Valoriser la mobilité sociale passe aussi par une culture du travail, du travail épanouissant et reconnu. 
C'est un programme de lutte contre l'assignation à résidence, de juste répartition de la valeur ajoutée, de lutte contre les rentes et les positions établies. Ce programme que nous mettons en œuvre en France depuis 2017, c'est celui qui passe par un investissement et des réformes massives à l'école, dans l'orientation scolaire, dans l'accès à l'université, dans la, le déploiement d'une politique d'apprentissage inédite en France et dans tout ce qui est la réforme du marché du travail pour sortir d'une société de statut qui s'était trop longtemps installée. Vaste programme, me direz-vous, beaucoup a été fait et beaucoup reste à faire. Le deuxième thème au cœur de ce défi de ce consensus, c'est le climat. Un des plus grands biens que nous avons en partage, en héritage, c'est notre terre, notre planète. Et pour la préserver, nous devons guider nos actions par des signaux clairs, pour internaliser les conséquences de nos actions sur l'environnement au cœur de nos systèmes économiques. Cela vaut pour les entreprises. En Europe, elles sont soumises à un prix du carbone, notamment via le système de quotas, qu'il va nous falloir renforcer pour tenir nos nouveaux objectifs, en complétant le système par un mécanisme d'ajustement carbone aux frontières, afin de permettre qu'il n'y ait pas de concurrence là aussi déloyale et que les produits importés soient sur un pied d'égalité avec notre politique climatique. Cela vaut aussi pour les financiers. Il faut orienter les flux de capitaux vers les projets les plus rentables du point de vue du climat par des incitations intelligentes, bien calibrées, mises en œuvre avec détermination. C'est tout le programme que nous avons lancé en Europe sur ce qu'on appelle Sustainable, Sustainable Finance. C'est aussi toute l'initiative à travers le One Planet Summit que nous avons lancé avec les fonds souverains, euh, les asset managers, les private equity, maintenant les entreprises qui sont en portefeuille, pour généraliser une méthodologie commune et continuer d'orienter les investissements qui soient compatibles avec notre politique de lutte contre le réchauffement climatique et pour la biodiversité. Cela vaut enfin pour les ménages qui doivent être informés dans leur choix de consommation, mais surtout accompagnés. Car nous courons à l'échec en cherchant à décourager une action polluante par un signal prix vigoureux ou trop vigoureux, si aucune alternative crédible n'est offerte et si aucun accompagnement social n'est garanti. La France a fait l'expérience d'une politique incomplète en la matière et nous en avons tiré toutes les conséquences. La transition est importante, elle doit passer par ce signal prix et il doit être accompagné d'abord d'un investissement public massif dans la recherche, l'innovation, les infrastructures pour transformer le modèle et aller plus vite et d'un accompagnement social massif pour permettre à nos classes moyennes, nos classes populaires, aux Françaises et aux Français pour qui ces transitions sont coûteuses, parfois insécurisantes, de pouvoir franchir ce cap. Troisième pilier de ce consensus, la santé. La crise sanitaire a rappelé combien elle était un enjeu public qui demandait une réponse collective et des investissements majeurs. Dès l'irruption de la pandémie en mars 2020, j'ai appelé à ce que le vaccin contre la Covid soit traité comme un bien public mondial. Je poursuis ce combat de toutes mes forces. Nous avons promu le don de doses et nous sommes désormais suivis. Nous devons aussi permettre la production de vaccins directement dans les pays les plus vulnérables. Et c'est pourquoi je m'emploie à lever les multiples obstacles qui l'empêchent aujourd'hui et qui bloquent le transfert de technologies, des transferts de savoir, le travail autour du médecine patent pool et la levée circonscrite, organisée de la propriété intellectuelle quand elle bride ce transfert de technologie. C'est cette troisième voie que nous avons suivie lorsqu'il s'est agi de développer les trithérapies dans les pays du Sud pour lutter contre le VIH. Cette troisième voie, elle est faisable en continuant à avoir la bonne rémunération pour l'innovation, mais en permettant de continuer d'accélérer le transfert de technologie. Apprenons là aussi du passé, sachons développer, en lien avec l'Organisation mondiale du commerce, l'Organisation mondiale de la santé, cette initiative qui est clé pour aider les pays à revenus intermédiaires en particulier et les pays émergents à développer des plateformes de production. Quatrième, qui y est le numérique. La crise euh, que nous venons de vivre du Covid a encore révélé des défaillances dans le modèle d'innovation européen. Nous n'investissons pas assez, nous sommes à la traîne, nous ne sommes pas assez numérisés, et pas assez, pas assez d'acteurs des technologies stratégiques indispensables à notre sécurité, notre indépendance, sont financés, développés, qu'il s'agisse d'argent public ou d'argent privé. Si nous ne voulons pas subir le monde qui se construit, mais le bâtir nous-mêmes, notre nouveau consensus doit explicitement intégrer ces enjeux autour du numérique qui sont les enjeux de financement de l'innovation et de souveraineté, et les deux ensemble. 
non pas une souveraineté agressive, mais une autonomie stratégique qui passe par une reprise de contrôle sur les technologies, sur les chaînes d'approvisionnement matérielles et logicielles et le renforcement de coopérations internationales à tous les stades, de la recherche à la commercialisation en passant par la production. Le développement des technologies numériques doit aussi nous pousser à élaborer de nouvelles régulations. Car la démocratisation du numérique, permise en apparence par les grands services numériques, repose en réalité sur les fondations originelles d'Internet. Les communs numériques mondiaux, le web, Linux, Mozilla, Wikipédia, etc., sont cette base. Et certains acteurs privés ou soutenus par d'autres puissances publiques tentent de s'approprier des espaces numériques fondés initialement sur les principes d'ouverture, de libre partage et de coopération. Ces acteurs privés, qui sont dans des situations de monopole de fait, qui sont des acteurs ultra-dominants et structurants du marché mondial, tentent insidieusement d'en fixer désormais les règles du jeu ou complètement d'y faire régner la loi qui est la loi du plus fort, qui par des acquisitions prédatrices vient aujourd'hui brider notre capacité à innover et construire notre modèle. Pour assurer notre autonomie, pour protéger le bien commun, c'est-à-dire un Internet libre et ouvert, la France et l'Europe doivent forger une nouvelle alliance avec ce monde des communs numériques, c'est-à-dire les soutenir, y contribuer et savoir les utiliser. En d'autres termes, nous, devenons, nous devons devenir le continent de l'innovation en matière de numérique et d'un financement massif, qu'il s'agisse du hardware comme du software. Nous devons construire nos propres régulations pour décider des règles démocratiques dont, vous, dont nous voulons nous prévaloir, qu'il s'agisse de fiscalité ou de régulation des contenus comme des acteurs. Et nous devons établir des coopérations nouvelles, comme nous avons su l'élaborer dans le cadre de l'appel de Christchurch pour pousser l'ensemble de la planète à créer un ordre public de ce nouvel espace. C'est ça, l'ensemble des composantes du bien commun qu'il y a autour du numérique. Cinquième pilier, finance et policy mix. Les flux financiers doivent servir à investir dans les biens communs de manière certaine. Je viens de l'évoquer, je dirais, à la cavalcade, pour ne pas prendre trop de votre temps. Mais nous avons besoin de la finance privée pour démultiplier les moyens, pour décentraliser l'identification des bons projets. Mais il faut pour cela que les règles intègrent explicitement ces objectifs des biens communs. Or, il faut bien le dire, les exigences de rendement monétaire du capital sont toujours très élevées, alors que les taux sont très bas. Et elles relèguent beaucoup trop la prise en compte des rendements sociaux. Il nous faut corriger cela. Et je me réjouis que vous consacriez une séance à ce sujet. Quant aux finances publiques et à la politique budgétaire, elles sont un moyen et non une fin en soi. Elles sont un des leviers à notre disposition pour atteindre des objectifs supérieurs de prospérité, d'inclusion, d'égalité entre générations. Sur ce sujet comme sur bien d'autres. Il est urgent de sortir là aussi des dogmes. Il faut arrêter de prendre la croissance comme une donnée, d'en déduire ensuite des conséquences mécaniques pour réguler nos finances publiques. Je pense que la période qui s'ouvre nous impose de raisonner à l'inverse. Fixons nos objectifs de croissance et donnons-nous les moyens de les atteindre. C'est d'ailleurs la seule possibilité, au moment que nous vivons, de ne pas rentrer dans un cycle qui serait celui de l'absence d'innovation ou d'effacement des investissements publics nécessaires pour penser et organiser la transformation du monde qui nous attend. Ça ne veut pas dire d'endosser quelque laxisme budgétaire que ce soit, mais plutôt de réinventer un cadre rigoureux d'évaluation de la qualité de la dépense publique. Enfin, la politique monétaire doit poursuivre son évolution. Dans les pays avancés, elle a su être réactive et efficace. Il faut désormais une réflexion globale sur le policy mix dans le contexte de croissance faible, de taux bas pour le moment, que nous subissons et que nous subissions avant crise, mais aussi dans un contexte de solidarité internationale. C'est pourquoi je promeux une mobilisation ambitieuse des droits de tirage spéciaux du FMI avant de faire bénéficier de l'arme monétaire aussi les pays les plus vulnérables, ce qui permettra de faire changer la dimension de réponse macroéconomique dans ces pays qui sont encore les plus ébranlés par la crise. Mais très clairement, nos politiques monétaires doivent légitimement être réinterrogées dans leurs fondements dans le contexte que je viens d'évoquer, qui est celui d'un nouveau paradigme international. À cet ordre du jour, qui est au fond un programme pour le XXIe siècle, nous devons penser, donc réinventer, un cadre monétaire, macro-budgétaire et de finances privées. Sinon, nous resterons dans un, dans un, dérègle, dans un dérèglement, pardonnez-moi, 
où il y a un excédent de liquidité mal utilisé, où il y a des règles budgétaires pensées au début des années 90 pour des convergences qui n'ont plus cours, et une puissance publique qui sortira en quelque sorte de la capacité à organiser ses communs, et une politique monétaire qui, reste, qui risque d'être inadaptée au moment où nos sociétés ont à penser la transformation du monde pour nous-mêmes et pour les générations à venir. Je voudrais rajouter deux remarques finales pour compléter, si je puis dire, ce nouveau paradigme pour le bien commun. D'abord, une remarque sur le commerce. Le consensus sur le libre-échange a clairement sous-estimé les externalités de voisinage, celles qui font qu'un emploi industriel dans les territoires attire avec lui une vie locale, des commerces, une vitalité de territoire. Sous ces termes techniques, c'est la trame même de la vie de nos concitoyens qui s'est parfois trouvée déchirée. Il nous faut corriger ces déséquilibres et nous demander comment mieux concilier les gains du commerce international qui ont permis dans certaines régions de sortir de la pauvreté des populations, de la concurrence qui elle aussi est bonne pour l'innovation et le bien commun. Mais il nous faut repenser ces objectifs avec la préservation de deux objectifs qui sont au cœur de notre modèle. L'objectif social et avec lui les dynamiques locales, la bonne santé des marchés de travail nationaux, sinon nous continuerons de les déchirer, et l'objectif environnemental. Il est impossible de penser le commerce du XXIe siècle en le pensant de manière séparée avec notre agenda climatique. Sinon, nous continuerons d'augmenter les règles en la matière dans des géographies qui continueront d'importer des biens faits avec des standards bien moindres venant d'autres géographies, ce qui est répliqué notre erreur historique en matière sociale dans le domaine du climat. Et donc le commerce est aussi un domaine dans lequel nous devons repenser notre paradigme et internaliser, là aussi, l'objectif social d'organisation de notre nation et environnementale. Ensuite, la démographie. Elle reste trop souvent un impensé des réflexions sur la dynamique économique mondiale. Or, les évolutions démographiques sont des forces tectoniques qui modèlent l'allocation de l'épargne et donc des investissements qui sous-tendent les défis à venir pour nos systèmes de protection sociale et qui sont une des composantes endogènes de notre croissance. La crise a aussi révélé l'enjeu de la solidarité entre les générations. Nous l'avons vécu intimement. C'est donc un défi auquel nous devons apporter des solutions tangibles. Parce que la situation sinon dans laquelle nous sommes, c'est que nous allons laisser aux générations à venir, aux plus jeunes déjà, une transition démocratique non financée, nos dettes budgétaires passées et un modèle où, en quelque sorte, seul le secteur privé aura à financer les communs ou pas. Je n'ai pas envie de prendre cette responsabilité. Et donc, nous devons intégrer cette solidarité intergénérationnelle et donc nos démographies dans cette composante. Mais dans le même temps, nous ne pouvons pas faire l'économie de regarder les démographies comparées des régions très développées du globe avec les régions très pauvres et de nous dire aujourd'hui que nous avons aussi besoin d'un investissement collectif sur les continents qui sont parfois les plus pauvres, mais où la croissance démographique sera encore massive dans les décennies qui viennent. Si nous ne les aidons pas à réussir, de fait, nous construisons un modèle, explicite ou implicite, qui sera structuré par une immigration choisie de beaucoup d'entre nous, qui est aussi à penser. Et on ne pourra pas le penser en des termes apaisés, si elle n'est pas regardée avec lucidité, et si on ne construit pas les voies et moyens d'aider les continents à forte démographie à réussir, pour eux-mêmes et pour leur jeunesse. Je n'ai de conscience, en disant tout cela, que je n'ai pas forcément simplifié votre équation et le début de vos travaux. J'ai partagé des convictions et des doutes, avec beaucoup d'humilité et beaucoup d'ambition. Parce que je crois que dans les moments que nous vivons, nous devons être ambitieux. Ambitieux dans nos objectifs, rigoureux dans la conception des bons outils et persévérant dans l'action et la mise en œuvre. Je suis sûr d'une chose, nous n'avons pas le droit de céder à quelque facilité que ce soit. Celle qui consisterait à dire « c'est un nouveau monde et donc affranchissons-nous de toute forme de rigueur ». On peut tout dépenser parce que tout ça n'a plus d'importance. L'avenir nous dira qu'il y a raison. Non. De la même manière, je pense que revenir au statut quo hanté et aux règles auxquelles nous sommes habitués est une autre forme de facilité. Il faut nous fixer ensemble de nouveaux objectifs pour sortir de la stagnation, qu'elle soit séculaire ou pas, et il n'y a aucune fatalité. Visons plus de croissance, c'est la seule 
le seul chemin qui nous permet de viser aussi plus de protection sociale, plus d'innovation, plus d'investissement dans la transition écologique. Visons plus d'égalité, de justice dans nos sociétés et entre continents, car c'est le seul moyen de nous attaquer à la racine des inégalités et des déséquilibres dans nos sociétés ou entre nos sociétés qui président aujourd'hui à l'affaiblissement de nos démocraties. Visons enfin plus de soutenabilité. Concilier des objectifs sociaux avec des objectifs environnementaux, c'est un défi, car ils ne sont pas naturellement alignés. À nous de les concilier par l'invention de nouveaux modèles, à la fois au niveau macroéconomique et au niveau microéconomique. Pour, nous parven... pour y parvenir, il nous faut de nouvelles idées, de nouvelles approches, sans renier les leçons de l'histoire. C'est pourquoi nous attendons des scientifiques qu'ils éclairent la lanterne du débat et des décideurs publics. Les deux jours qui s'ouvrent permettront de faire le point sur l'état de nos connaissances, d'esquisser un programme de travail collectif pour sortir de la crise. Je suis particulièrement heureux d'introduire vos travaux au moment même où je m'apprête d'ailleurs à recevoir ce travail d'économistes, de, des meilleurs scientifiques internationaux qui ont été pilotés par messieurs Blanchard et Tirol et qui ont accepté pendant des mois de faire travailler, malgré les contraintes sanitaires, à travers le monde, plusieurs de vos collègues pour aider à réfléchir sur ces sujets, justement, et un peu dans la même direction. Mais je suis sûr que ce sommet nous permettra d'avancer. Et vous savez, comme moi, à la fois l'urgence, la passion, parfois l'impatience qui préside à ces travaux. Alors j'attends avec beaucoup d'impatience, oui, de connaître vos propositions pour sauver le bien commun. Bon travaux et merci par avance. Thank you, Mr. President. Merci, Monsieur le Président, for having introduced our Common Good Summit. And uh, now we will have our first session. Uh, I am uh, back in the studio with Jean Tiron, and we will welcome um, Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee. So I am pleased to see you uh, by video. And um, so uh, all of you are Nobel laureates. All of you have written on common good. You know I have uh, the book of Jean which is uh, called in English the Economy for Common Good, and uh, Abhijit and Esther, I have yours also, uh, which is uh, Good Economics for Hard Times, so I know that uh, you are quite aware about uh, uh, the bien commun, common good. Jean, do you feel uh, comfortable with the approach of uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron, even if he insists using the word the common goods on plural, so, uh, uh, but uh, it's uh, just a detail. Well, listening to uh, the president, I can see both a reaffirmation of uh, liberal democracy with all its problems like uh, market failures and short-termism of governments. But at the same time, there's also a description of uh, five or six common goods with an S. And uh, those are a clean environment, a good health for everyone. I noted uh, the regulation of the digital companies and innovation, um, a better equality, of course, and, and finance unleashed for socially uh, good projects. So all those are uh, key uh, common goods for the future of our society and therefore for the common good. Okay, so Esther, I will have the second question uh, with you. In which fields the common good suffers with the pandemic, please? Uh, in the short term, of course, the, the immediate cost was to our health, which is a common good. Uh, and almost immediately after, in, uh, there was a risk of... Um, a potential a breakdown in economic inequality, where we've we've seen, for example, a huge growth in big uh, fortunes uh, in in rich countries. At the same time, as we saw uh, a rise in in poverty around the world. So there is also uh, the, the president talked about inequality as a common bad, and there was also a risk of uh, of, of increasing that common bad in the world in during the pandemic. The, we were, I think, within the rich countries, both the US and in Europe, reasonably successful at uh, using um, social programs and large expenditures to uh, keep 
a certain amount of uh, global solidarity together. And in particular, the fact that we were able in Europe to the, the paid furlough um, to employ people, to continue to employ people and pay them even as, as there, there was less demand for the, for the goods that their company produced, was something which was uh, a pretty fundamental way in which we maintain uh, the common goods of having a, a, a common society. And in fact, that is, I think this is something that we should keep with us, uh, that the, the temporary rethinking of what social solidarity means, uh, of our willingness to have a social protection system, which is uh, um, which has a good attitude towards the people it helps and doesn't have a punitive attitude, is something something that I hope we can keep with us as we move to towards the future. The last uh, one, the last risk to the common good that the pandemic might uh, cause is um, something where I think we face a choice and maybe something that Abhijit can elaborate on later, which is we now really much sit at a crossroads now that a lot of our population in rich countries are getting vaccinated of what is going to happen vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world. And from that decision, a lot of other decisions will go through. For example, uh, we'll, if, if the pandemic exists in the rest of the world, we might decide to close our borders to goods and to people. So, this, so we might lose a common good that is a global common good of people moving around if we are not able to, um, to deal today with the pandemic at a global common level. Yes, Esther, we will uh, go further about this question of vaccine uh, all, all over the world. And I will ask you um, something more specific uh, uh, to uh, Abhijit, Abhijit Banerjee. Uh, I will be glad to have your anal analysis uh, on the specific impact of uh, pandemic on less developed countries. Well, uh, I think that it's uh, it's a little bit hard to put them all together. I think that's part of part of uh, what I want to start by saying is that you they have countries like India, Pakistan, um, you know Brazil, which have had enormous, and Argentina now, they, who have had enormous uh, waves of COVID. South Africa. Then there are countries where I think it's still either not ha happened or. It has happened, but we have not been able to document. And I, I, and I don't know how much of which it is. And partly it's a, it's a sad fact about our kind of global surveillance of COVID that we don't actually, uh, we didn't take the trouble to find out whether or not, uh, you know, in Mali, uh, is really, are there many people dying or is it the case that the disease hasn't reached? And I, I think we don't actually know. So that's uh, point number one. The point number two I want to make is that where the the poor countries of the world are had a very different experience from the rich countries. Many of them actually locked down very quickly. Um, India locked down um, with with four hours of notice to its uh, just close the country. Once you close the country, there were people stranded in uh, the big cities uh, with no support. There were there are often people who work on daily wages, who send most of their wages home to their village, who uh, live on the construction sites or in the shop where they work. And those people were just stranded. They had no way of surviving. Uh, this welfare system it was not designed for that. So the welfare system is present, but it serves mostly people who are at home. And the idea of, so you know, of, you know maybe 30, 40 million migrants who were stranded in the cities was never, was not there when this system was designed. So as a result, what happened was a lot of people had nothing to eat, nowhere to stay. They, and the transportation was shut down as a part of the lockdown. As a result, a bunch of them walked home a thousand kilometers in the May heat in India. So I think the magnitude of the human tragedy that was associated with, with this lockdown was enormous and where I think the world really failed, I think the poor countries and India is not the poorest country. So I would say that's just an example is in 
finding any way to finance this process. So, you know, this this was poor countries spent 2% of GDP bailing out the people, rich countries spent 20%. So that's, that's the order of magnitude of difference uh, where you could say that, you know, poor people in poor countries who are the poorest people in the world got the least amount of money. Poor people in richer countries did much better. And I think that that's probably the, I think the most, Maybe the most glaring aspect of this uh, of this uh, pandemic was that. And now we'll, I mean, now there's going to be other glaring aspects on who gets vaccinated. But let's come back to that later. Okay. So obviously, as uh, Esther said, uh, vaccination is one of the main topics. Jean, um, when you look uh, about uh, this uh, aim to uh, vaccine seven million people, is that possible? I think it is, actually, because we had had this wonder about uh, the vaccines coming very soon, several of them. It's very impressive. At the same time, we need to do more for those countries that Abhijit was talking about. Uh, so, for example, we, have, we are going to have extra doses of uh, vaccine. Uh, not, I'm not talking about RNA, RNA messenger, because that's not prop, appropriate for for LDCs because of the temperature of minus 70 Celsius, it's impossible to, to distribute. But the other ones we can easily distribute. We can uh, be more generous uh, too. I mean, COVAX, which is the international initiative to distribute vaccines, manufacture and distribute vaccine L LDCs, um, has only $7 billion actually available. And it's not enough, so we need, uh, we need more funding. Uh, we need more uh, licensing and and technology transfer. Actually, the president talked about that, using the medicine uh, patent pool, so as to pull the to pull the, the patents and and make them available for for the poor countries. But for that, we need the the rich countries actually to to pay for some of the costs. Uh, it's not someone has to pay for the costs, and that's that's actually very important. And we should not uh, keep aside the ingredients the way the U.S. has done, for example, because. What's really limiting things right now is not patents so much. It's mainly, I mean, if you think about AstraZeneca, it's only $2, $2 a dose, it's, it's nothing. Uh, but the production facilities and the technology transfer, and that we haven't done, and, 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 a, and a medicine patent pool could help with that. Uh, Esther, I want to ask you something about the attitude of Western countries. You said to me that uh, they have sent very few vaccine doses uh, to less developed countries. It, does that mean that uh, Western countries are against the common good doing that? Um, definitely not. They're absolutely not gone to, in the direction of the common good. I mean, from the big, very beginning of the pandemic, um, the, the operation warp speed in the US was something really unique and unprecedented. The effort to and the effort to invest in production capacity on vaccines that were not proven yet. There was something phenomenal, and having done that is quite remarkable. And this is actually the reason why the US was so quick, not only in having a vaccine, but in having a vaccine that they could actually deliver into people's arms. It's because they invested in production capacity. The problem is they did that they invested in enough production capacity for the rich countries, not for the world. So from the beginning, if you want, the, the, the pipes that were laid out were too narrow. From the beginning, they should have been thinking, if we are going to take this massive risk of investing in unknown vaccine, we should do it enough that we can vaccinate the world. But it was thought about, let's do it enough that we, we can vaccinate ourselves. And then, of course, they immediately proceeded to corner the world's supply. Um, in, by February, the, the, the rich countries had, had basically bought most of the production. COVAX not only is chronically, uh, is terribly underfunded, but also had basically no doses to, to even purchase, even before uh, um, things went uh, pear shaped in India, and therefore where the, India, who had been producing most of the doses for COVAX, stopped. Even before that, they just didn't have enough doses. So they had... Uh, 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 vaccinated uh, a few million people when their objective was to vaccinate two billion people. 
And so from the get-go, it was sort of about on a country-by-country -country basis, you know, the fastest possible, and not at all as a common good, uh, as a common good problem. And then later, on, then the U.S. was holding doses, and the U.S. had has uh, as. Uh, uh, Jean was alluding to the U.S. has a restriction on the export of material, which means that uh, uh, the Serum Institute in India was pleading and begging to get the material that would allow them to uh, manufacture the vaccine, and they were not getting them. The pharmaceutical companies were insisting that they were not going to share patents, that it was not the issue, and that uh, it would be terrible for the whole world if they were forced to share grants, and so on and so forth. So everyone was a little bit in the same position, which is it's like me, myself, and then after that, we'll see. And um, what is a little bit disappointing is that uh, from the government, all the right words were said. All the right words were said in saying there is one health that as long as the pandemic is not uh, uh, overcome everywhere in the world, it's still with us. And it's a moral necessity, and it's also in our self-interest. All of that, we've heard President Macron say that, and President Biden say that, and uh, Ursula von Leyen say that. But until now, it really hasn't been followed with by any real action. And all of the actions we can see until now have, uh, with a small exception of donating of a few doses from France and then from the US, recently have been uh, uh, completely uh, selfish. So that's something that we need to change right this minute. So, we really needed to change some months ago, but <coughs> right this minute would be better than in many months from now. Okay, uh, listening, Esther, Abhijit, I would ask you if you consider also that the Biden initiative of free access for COVID vaccine is um, a kind of uh, failure or just words that like, say, says Esther? I, I guess it's, uh, I hope it's not, but it, it was not followed up by any any action that seems even remotely uh, credible. So it's, you know, they, they said it and then it was, a, it's a good thought. It made, made us all optimistic. Then we've been waiting. It's been a while since they said it and we haven't heard anything about, you know, these, uh, uh, we've heard from, for example, the Moderna CEO, that this would be an impossible task to transfer the technology, which I find implausible, given that India is a very large producer of vaccines in the world, and it wasn't such an enormous uh, set of uh, new breakthroughs that Moderna made. The NIH had already created a platform for it. Um, so given all that, I find it, um, let's say, I'm skeptical that there was a really uh, an honest desire to share, which is just kind of, it's because it's just not possible to share it. And, but that's that rhetoric has not been challenged. The U.S. government hasn't come out and said that, okay, well, we don't, we're going to try uh, whether you like it or not. This is just, there is a level at which this, this seems like one of the other pious thoughts that were kind of launched and then and not, uh, you know, you, you, it's, you feel good, you say the right thing, then you don't, don't do any, anything about it. Therefore, you don't have to uh, pay any political costs either. And that seems uh, the worst of all possible worlds. In a sense, I, I, I would prefer a certain degree of honesty on these things. Okay, Jean, uh, in his address, President Macron says very clearly, vaccines has to become a world public asset. And uh, does it mean that, uh, um, that the expropriation of intellectual property is part of the common good? Well, let me first say that I fully agree with Abhijit that the US move was largely PR because it's not very costly to look good when you know that others won't say it. And your own administration is not going to do anything about it. So uh, we have to realize that lots of that is, is public relation. So, uh, now, the question is whether you should expropriate patents. And there I will distinguish uh, between two populations, the rich world and the less developed countries. Uh, because in the end, the, uh, the pharma companies will do the research only if they can recoup their investment uh, through revenues. 
And if the rich world doesn't want to pay revenues on pharma, not huge prices, of course. You know, if we have compulsory licensing, which allows you, if uh, the pharma is too greedy, actually to actually expropriate then the pharma, but not systematically expropriate the pharma. Now, for LDCs, it's different because for LDCs, they don't have much money. And of course, they should have that for free. So I will distinguish between two things. The rich world has to pay, because otherwise there won't be anything. Let me give you some examples here. Um, if you think about orphan diseases, uh, very small numbers. Until 1983, there was no research done anymore on orphan diseases. And then it was, there was a law in 1983 in the US, and then in Europe, and in Japan, and so on, uh, pushing incentives. And now you have hundreds of patents and, and, and medicines which are delivered uh, for orphan, orphan diseases. Same thing uh, with, uh, with antibiotic resistance. So, you know, one of the big issues now is that uh, uh, antibiotics are old and there is more and more resistance to them. And, of course, we are going to have another pandemic, other pandemics due to antibiotic resistance. And yet there is no R&D done, very little, and Europe has started a consortium so as to address that. So you have to create the incentives. And, and that's something to be remembered, because pandemics, pandemics there will be others. Um, you will have antibioresistance, we'll have the bacteria and viruses released from the perma, permafrost. We have biological warfare and so on and so forth. So it's not the last crisis. And we must have some credibility that the rich world will, have, will pay, not outrageous prices, again. You can, if they ask for outrageous prices, you can use compulsory licensing. But you know, we'll pay some, and then we can make those available uh, to, uh, to poor countries. And that's a common good, to my view, in my view. OK, speaking um, most generally about uh, the system and the failure of the system, failure of capitalism, do you think that it appears broader with the pandemic? Uh, and the question is for uh, all of you. Well, maybe I, I, I could start. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, there are things which got worse, for sure. Inequality, which is, of course, one of the market failures of, of capitalism, of market economies, has gotten worse both within countries and across countries. And that was already mentioned by Esther. Uh, so that has gotten worse, and you know, for good reasons. We know why. So uh, we failed. Now, whether the market... Why, why we failed? I mean, take the educational system in France, for example. Um, the good schools were prepared. Uh, the kids who were, were in good school could continue with a good education. And, and the bad schools didn't succeed. Even, and you, we have to remember that uh, in terms of math and science, we are uh, almost last in, among OECD countries. And that's a key to many good jobs for the future. So it's, we both have a, an education system which is not very good and is extremely unequal. And this inequality, of course, you know, it's more and more, and more important. The input of your parents, the input of your environment becomes even more important during a pandemic. And you know, so you could exactly predict what, what will happen. Um, so the rest of the market economy, if you think about vaccines, for example, that has been remarkable. Actually, after a year, less than a year, we have all those vaccines, it's fantastic. Supply chains, I mean, we had no problems with getting stuff in shops. Uh, all those things have, have worked pretty well. Now, the governments then have not worked very well. I mean, they have been, as, as Abhijit and Esther said, very selfish, very selfish with respect to the poor countries. They have rushed to get the ingredients and so on for the vaccines. Um, my country first. It's always, you know, the populist mot motive is, is here again. And, Surprisingly so with, with Joe Biden. We could have believed that Joe Biden would have been very different from Donald Trump on that front as well. But he's not. My country first. Um, so lack of preparation from, for pandemics. And that's, that's related to a more common theme. Which if, if you look at the biggest, the biggest uh, failures of the state in reacting to the uh, market failures, you see long-term issues, climate change, inequality, preparation from pandemics, 
debt, and so on and so forth. You could education, research. That's where the failures are the most visible. Esther, what's your opinion about uh, capitalism after the pandemic? I, um, I've made a career uh, not answering a uh, um, question at that level of <laughs> at that level of generality. So, so I think I should stick to that. This has worked pretty well for me to look at more uh, detailed uh, detailed things. Um, But I think some aspects, some aspect of, uh, of, 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 go of government response and of the society's response were actually pretty encouraging, uh, and in particular, and, and should uh, should teach us how we can think about the, how we can think about the future. In particular, uh, I already mentioned the, the, the social protection during the pandemic. So in, both in Europe and in the U.S., we uh, very quickly there was a, um, a, a, a rapid reaction of governments of not letting the poorest citizen go completely, or even also the middle class citizen, everyone really, not letting high and dry uh, due to the lockdowns. And as Abhijit mentioned, it was a big uh, difference between uh, the rich countries and the poor economy in this regard, because the rich country could borrow to make it happen when the poor countries didn't have that scope. And one of our failures at the global level is that we were not able to help them do it financially. But one of our success at the local level is that we were able to um, to protect people against this shock. And uh, the second thing that is interesting in this regard is that when you look at what happened to people's willingness to work when they received this very generous compensation. So, for example, in the U.S., the unemployment insurance became $600 a week at the beginning of the pandemic. And you would have, for a lot of people, it means that they were they were getting more money unemployed than employed. And you immediately there was a response <laughs> from the political establishment and a part of the conservative press saying, "Look, the people are not going to go back to work because it's so it's too advantageous to be sitting at home." And a lot of economists looked into it, and what they found is that that just didn't happen. That basically there was no no negative deleterious impact of this, of this very very generous help on people's labor supply. So what does it tell us? I think it's not a fail, it's not a failure. It's a success, uh, and it's not a failure of capitalism. It's a success of our of our liberal democracy in a way. And but that should tell us that. Um, we can now take this lesson on board and say, well, moving forward, in order to address uh, the, the, the inequality, but in particular the inequality at the bottom, the fact that there are people who just don't have the same chances as, as others, there are kids who grow up in poverty who will become poor themselves if they are not helped, we can do something uh, by rethinking a little bit the social protection system we have today. And so I mostly want to, instead of thinking of whether this is a, um, you know, highlighting the potential failure of capitalism, here highlighting the potential success of uh, um, a more, you know, civilized and so organized uh, uh, version of capitalism we could have moving forward. Okay, and Abhijit, what uh, we have uh, learned uh, during the pandemic from the uh, reaction in the last development countries, uh, for instance, uh, against inequality, for instance? May I think, let me start by a little bit adding to what Esther said, which is that, and I think it's re related to what I'm going to say about left, less developed countries. So I think what, what was, um, I think, very uh, clear, and in a sense, this is a shift that has started before the pandemic, actually during the Great Recession, is that we, we are now, governments are now much more prepared to think about the European Central Bank, the archetypal, extraordinarily conservative uh, monetary institution, was completely prepared to print money to, to fi finance this uh, expansion of uh, government spending. And that, 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 in a sense, was a shift in, in macroeconomic thinking that started during the Great Recession, I would say, and probably had roots before. But I think I think that that means that we're in a place where um, interest rates are extremely low, 
and the the um, you know the world uh, is now more willing to say we can we can borrow a lot and uh, you know in a sense the absence of good good access to park your money in has been uh, something that people have been talking about for a while and now i think people are responding to that so i i do think that there is a given part of the fact that there's so much inequality means there's a lot of wealth that actually needs some place to be parked. And I think that's the, the result of that is that there is actually scope for uh, much more expansionary uh, policies which include financing the rest of the world. I, I, it's one of the things that I think is uh, completely clear to me is that there is no reason to be so cheap. Uh, and I think probably the lesson I, I, I think we learned is, is that you could get away with 20% uh, of GDP, adding 20% of GDP to the expenditure. And I think you should take that as not saying that's what you do every day. Obviously, that's not going to be sustainable eventually. But that, you know, if you had to spend $50 billion is the number that the IMF suggests for vaccinating the whole world. It's just a, a drop in that ocean, 20% of GDP of the OECD, uh, something of that order of magnitude. This is the, like you wouldn't even notice it. So I, I think we need to be just realistic about just how much more generous we can be. So I would say the biggest lesson is that we can get away with being generous. The economic system is quite forgiving of it. We could do it. It's, there's no economic argument. I mean, there's often this argument which says that where will the resources come from? 0.7% of GDP is like a, 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 a goal for aid. That's To me, that's ridiculous. It's always been ridiculous, but this, if I had to say one thing this does, it highlights how ridiculous that is. You know, we could spend 20% on our uh, on our people, but we can't spend 1% or than 0.7% on the rest of the world. 1% would pay for all the vaccines and every, and some social support to the poor in the poorest countries and everything else. Uh, I, I I find it a little appalling that that's, that hasn't happened. On the other hand, this highlights the fact that it's not that hard to make it happen financially. Whether the political will is there, whether... Mr. Biden is also happy to just, you know, look inside. That those are questions. I mean, uh, I'm glad that President Macron was quite, um, you know, aggressive on that question. And I, I feel that we really need to be uh, much, much less uh, conservative on that point. And we have no reason to be that conservative. Speaking about uh, Mr. Biden, the uh, he, he take advantage of this period to uh, uh, impulse his um, uh, initiative of a minimum level of taxation for the companies. Uh, would you think, Jean, as you said uh, uh, before, that it was kind of a public relation uh, uh, initiative? Well, that I, I cannot really say, but uh, I'm not an expert in taxation either, but uh, Clearly, we don't like, no economist is going to like loopholes and optimize, tax optimization because it's not fair fundamentally, regardless of uh, what you think the right uh, tax pressure should be. You don't think that loopholes and, uh, and optimization, tax optimization is a good thing. Uh, the other thing is that uh, today we have uh, too much taxation on the immobile factors and uh, too little taxation on mobile ones. So mobile ones, of course, are capital. And more and more, there are people who create firms and, and value and jobs. So the entrepreneur, the academics, and so on, who tend to, to go abroad and, and get uh, better working condition and better salaries. And that, that's something which, which is an issue, of course, and we need to react to that. Now, uh, I'm very happy that uh, Joe Biden is actually is joining the movement, but is rejoining the movement because uh, what has been happening in the last few years is a very intense work by the OECD, the tax-based erosion uh, sorts. And what I will be worried about his move is that this will be uh, some way to finance his program, his uh, stimulus program, um, when actually part of the OECD uh, uh, program was to actually make this uh, taxation of capital uh, more fair across countries and not only between labor and, and capital. So I think we, we have to watch. It's a good, good move, but uh, uh, the jury is still out. Okay, Stel, do you give any credit to uh, uh, the President Biden for his initiative? I think it 
would be excellent to make it happen. I think the way that the politics is working in the Senate at the moment, it's likely to be very small. Um, but it would already be something. Because uh, once you have a very small tax, it means that you have to put all of the machinery in place to make it happen. And, uh, and so uh, the hope, I think my best hope for, for this particular tax uh, is to is that it's it's put in place at a fairly low level, which means that all of the pipes are in place and we can decide then it becomes possible, the, the, the technical apparatus is in place to make it uh, larger in the future. So I think it does make a big difference that he's decided to go um, to get behind it. And I, I hope that they succeed um, and they can they can pass it at whatever level, because then we have kind of the principle we can make it uh, make it bigger. It's the same thing about the wealth taxation, by the way, which um, is that if they manage to get a, if they manage to pass a wealth taxation even at a very low level, that establishes the, the principle of at least keeping track of how much wealth people have. And that means that in the future, it becomes a possibility, should the next government want to tax wealth, uh, to, to, to do it. But that seems even less likely that, that, is, that it happens. And, uh, okay. and if the stimulus, if the, if, the, if, the, if the problem for that is to finance uh, the, the redistribution within the, within the US, then, you know, so be it. That's, I'll, I'll take that. Okay, uh, following on the fiscal policy, there is some uh, um, alternative uh, proposals coming from economists. I think about uh, uh, the French uh, Mr. Piketty and even the Mr. Ragion in, uh, in uh, some fields, that uh, because of uh, uh, rich people had become uh, richer with the uh, pandemic, uh, not with the pandemic, but uh, with the uh, uh, consequences of easy money. Uh, do you think that uh, it will be fair to have a, a special wealth tax, uh, perhaps in order to pay some of the debts, but uh, perhaps in order to be just fair? I don't know if Jean or Abhijit uh, would have a, an opinion on uh, uh, these uh, uh, taxation uh, proposals. I can jump in. I mean, I, I don't even think there is a fairness issue here, right? It's very hard for me to, I, I, I never understood why uh, large ownership of property is considered fair. I think the conversation about fairness uh, I, I, on that point is a, a kind of a bizarre um, kind of, uh, you know, libertarian uh, or Kind of holdover. I don't. I don't understand even the logic of why we fair not to tax wealth much, much more than is taxed. I mean, I, I would support uh, much more uh, aggressive taxation than anybody uh, probably is uh, realistically proposing. Uh, I don't see. A, I mean, w the whole society, in a sense, that sort of I think of the common good as being uh, what sustains partly allows this people to make so much money. I think if, if people were rioting in the streets because they are being treated badly, because their lives are miserable, eh, you would not be able to make that much money. I think, I think the idea that you can make enormous amounts of money and that that's, uh, that's your right and to keep all of it is your right and, and taking it away is unfair, to me it's completely backwards. I, th I think you are allow allowing you to keep any of it is, pro is fair and uh, is probably um, already generous. Now, I understand there's some incentive arguments to be made, but I'm not even very compelled by them. So, I, in general, I don't... I really don't have the feeling that the fairness is the question we are addressing here. It's, it's completely fair to have quite, uh, as, uh, as Philippe or uh, Thomas Piketty have suggested, to have much more uh, aggressive taxation of the rich. I, I think it's just, a, it's just a, a tragedy that it doesn't happen. So, Jean, uh, can, I uh, about, uh, can I say something? Yes, about yes, the Esther, and, uh, and we will have Jean after. Okay, Esther. Yeah, just a, just a technical, technical point, but very important, is that sometimes people say, well, you know, we shouldn't tax wealth because uh, we already tax income. So or we should do everything via income taxation, but once income is taxed, there is no reason to tax wealth again. And there is actually a powerful argument to tax wealth, 
is that the wealthier you are, uh, the easier it is to not pay income taxes, uh, on par in particular on the income of that wealth. So it sounds silly, but if you are very, very, very wealthy, most of your money is in the stock market and it's reinvested. And once it's reinvested, absolutely legally here, we are not talking about the illegal uh, putting the money in uh, in Luxembourg or, or in Panama, which people also do, but absolutely legally, as soon as the, the, the proceeds of your wealth are reinvested, you're never taxed on it. Which means that for someone who is more wealthier than what they can consume, which is true for people who have very large wealth, they end up not paying income taxes on a, a big part of their wealth. Of the of the income that is generated by their wealth, which is just the interest rate coming from the the, the rate, of, rate of return they're getting on their wealth, and therefore it seems fair, like really fair from the point of view of equality in 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 front of the tax system, and you know as Jean say, economists don't like loophole, loopholes, that we have a way of taxing those un, unrealized income. And some countries, like the Netherlands, used to have a tax on unrealized income. It's very difficult to put in place administratively. So if, in fact, you're thinking of a wealth tax that is above a certain amount of money, you're paying, let's say, 2% on your wealth, this is equivalent to about a half of the income that is generated by their wealth, or even a third if it's 2%, since people can make at least 6% on their wealth. And therefore, it is just a way of imposing the income from that, that, that is generated by this wealth, and therefore making sure that a, a, a billionaire or a millionaire is paying income taxes the same way that a teacher is paying income taxes or a, or a nurse is paying income taxes. So I think that's the right way to think about it. And so at some level, irrespective of your view on redistribution in general, uh, it seems to me relatively... Uh, a straightforward to be in favor of uh, wealth tax for very high wealth, uh, at, at least at a, at a fairly low level. And then you can take it from there, depending on where your taste happens to lie in terms of redistribution. But this is question of uh, a moderate tax, tax, wealth tax on very high income, on very high wealth, uh, seems to be uh, um, just a fairly straightforward way of having a uniform uh, uh, taxation system. Jean, uh, let's be um, more direct. So would it mean that uh, rich people are against common good? I think uh, in the end, I mean, of course, they can promote the common good by giving their wealth away. And that's what Bill Gates and others have done. At the same time, it's very useful and they have done a good job, for example, with Gavi, I mean, because they, they oversee actually the production process and, uh, and it's, they make sure sometimes that it's going to good use. But at the same time, you cannot generalize the system too much because otherwise really that means that those billionaires are actually doing the public policy. So there should be some of it, but you, you have to, to do also, the government has to take its, its, do its job. And as Esther said, first of all, you have to get rid of all the loopholes. In the US, it's incredible. I mean, you have those billionaires who, make, who pay 20% income tax. Uh, this is really unheard of. I mean, just like, how can this be? I mean, there are lots of loopholes uh, which are the outcome of lobbying and so on. So we, we need to actually have a much uh, fairer tax system. And then we have to reconsider everything together. So, you know, should we have a wealth tax? I, it's, in France, it's pretty symbolic. I mean, because you know the numbers are pretty small compared to the U.S. The potential wealth wealth stack in the U.S., which, by the way, I mean, the most radical candidates in the U.S. were proposing a wealth tax uh, starting at fifty million dollars, right? Pretty pretty high sums, right? And we don't have those billionaires here, they have in the U.S. Um, but in the end, you know, you have to reconsider the entire thing: the income tax, the capital gain tax, the inheritance tax. Another tax, which is very important, but has lots of loopholes. And finally, the, the, the wealth tax. And you have to look at the entire system. And on the capital gains, let me make a remark here, is that we, even in France, we are not very good at thinking about it, at all levels. Uh, you know, in the end, if you, look at, if you look at what happened during the pandemics, um, Amazon and Google and Facebook made a lot of money. Um, some of it is deserved, actually. We are very happy to be able to buy 
purchase uh, books, you know, when we could not purchase them elsewhere. I mean, there, there, there was a good logistic system uh, behind it, but uh, you know, in the end, they make huge amount of money, which is like uh, like luck, right? And then, you know, monopolies. You know, and actually, the president mentioned that we have to have competition policy to limit their power. And you know, some of the money they make actually is through their monopoly power. So we, we have to be very careful about that. But the capital gains tax is actually a good tax if you think about it, because it doesn't tax, it tax what you what you make just out of luck. And same thing at all levels. I mean, you know, people in Paris can be very rich because they own an apartment which just by chance grew, the value of which grew with the bubble in a huge amount. Or when you build a new subway line, then all at once the apartments are extremely expensive and there is no tax for that. So we need to be better, but that's a question of machinery, as, uh, as Esther said, about being able to, to actually address, you know, we, you know, I think uh, Abhijit mentioned uh, incentives, um, and that's, you know, there's a trade-off between incentive and redistribution. Everything else will be, we like redistribution better, right? Uh, but for that, you, you know, when you, whenever you have a lucky dollar, it must be taxed fully. Yes, but you know, we have also to take into consideration the level of the taxation of each country. Yes. And I would be glad to know uh, um, what is a good level up to you, Jean, in France, up to Esther in uh, the States where you are living, uh, in the uh, poor country, uh, speaking for uh, uh, Abhijit. Uh, what, what? Because uh, we, we know that it's completely different, and so we, we have to, to perhaps put all of that in perspective. Well, we may have different tastes among countries, of course, and you know, in the end, you can have a big welfare state, provided it's efficient, and then have a big taxation. That's perfectly fine. And uh, some countries, like a low, smaller welfare state, also. Now you see the US is moving toward a European welfare state and has to raise its taxes. So there is some convergence, which I think is a very good thing, actually. Um, but in the end, we need, you cannot just do that in your corner. You know, when you choose your fiscal system, you have to take into account that the resources which are mobile, so basically, you know, the, the creator of wealth, capital, they are easily, they can easily move abroad. So you need uh, agreements across countries. And I, I think, you know, just like Abhijit and Esther, I think it's very good news that Biden is willing to join uh, the OECD process because that's, you know, and then, you know, whether it's going to be 15% or minimum tax or 20%, then we can discuss. But, you know, the main thing is that we have some, some common flaw on taxation. What is a good level of taxation in a poor country, uh, Abhijit? Um... I think that there are two separate issues there. One is uh, what can you collect? And uh, one of the big challenges have, in poor countries has been collecting. Uh, and that's partly a matter of um, state capacity, partly a matter of, of um, you know, the availability of tax havens. I mean, I, I think that if you, uh, you know, the uh, there's a new story in the last few days of a, a man who had um, borrowed $1.5 billion and was in Antigua from in India, defaulted on the loan, and then moved to Antigua and was, uh, an Indian government was trying to, you know, catch him. But he's a, I think the presence of these tax havens is an extraordinary, I mean, to go back to Junjo's point, the coordination of, of taxes is, is especially costly in developing countries. I mean, the, if you look at the Panama Papers, you, you see the elites of so many developing countries are there. Uh, you know, the, the Swiss have now become much more um, aggressive against that, but there are plenty of countries. Maldives uh, will do, do it for you, Antigua, um, uh, you know, uh, Panama. There are many, many countries which will do it. So I, I think that part of it is before we can talk about, you know, the need, levels of taxation that are needed to create, for example, I mean, most, it's a very simple, 
relationship between GDP per capita and and taxes, and it's very strongly increasing. I mean, in poor countries, 15% of GDP is a is a pretty high number. In France, it's more like 45% of GDP. So it's, it's it's an extreme difference, and that limits the capacity of the state to invest in what they need to invest in. The health infrastructure is one of the reasons we're having this disaster is because there's no investment in the health infrastructure. There's no investment in the educational infrastructure. There is or not enough investment. There's not enough interest investment in other infrastructure. And so I, I think that it's very clear that uh, even I mean, even the people on the politically on the right would like in developing countries typically want to increase the share of government. There's not really very little disagreement on that. Where the disagreement is, how do you pay for that? How do you make it happen? And whether or not uh, you can, you know, whether you can uh, plug those loopholes uh, that. And I think uh, there's a that's a combination of, of course, we uh, I think the technologies of of collecting taxes have got a lot better. I think we should be more confident in raising taxes. In my view, the last 15 years, we have been actually learning how to collect taxes. The digitalization of the economy has made it easier to collect taxes in many countries. You know, also, um, you know, you know much more about people, uh, some some good, some bad. Uh, and so I, I think it's possible to increase the level of taxation. Countries were sort of burnt when they had very high levels of taxation and nobody paid. And so they, they went to having very low levels of taxation. And I think that's now time to reverse it. And I think that the, the willingness to reverse it is, I mean, China being the good, a good example of a country which did insist on collecting taxes and has raised its level of taxation GDP quite successfully. I think that example should be followed by other developing countries. And China has certain, uh, you know, punitive powers which democracies don't have, and uh, that that's going to make it a little harder. But I think global cooperation on on uh, closing the tax havens is going to already help a lot. I think that's one of the great uh, great uh, shames that you know money just you know vanishes. Uh, and then the, then the people who default on loan vanish as well. And it is, it, there's a series of people who have just borrowed a lot, defaulted, and gone to where there's their nice bank account is. And I, th I think that process is just intolerable. For uh, And so I think we need to think of global cooperation, the point John was making, but even more emphatically for developing countries. Is there just a point of view coming from the States? Um, uh, the, uh, is the President uh, uh, Biden in a good direction in order to uh, uh, increase the taxation in the States? So in, uh, in the, 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 uh, the ranking of countries, uh, according to Abhijit, which is the, the most developed countries have higher taxes and the least developed and poorest country have lower taxes, then by this ranking, the U.S. is a very poor country because uh, the U.S. Uh, only raised about 25% of, this, of its GDP in taxes compared to about 45% for France, which is high, but 38% uh, for the OECD. Very few countries in the OECD raise uh, less taxes than France, it's, than the U.S. It's at uh, it's uh, kind of uh, uh, close to a world record. I think it's the third lowest or something like that. So there is certainly a long, long way to long ways to go. And um, the the advantage of having an ambitious, uh, or at least you know, ambitious by U.S. standard distribution program with the idea of the you know introducing. Uh, Preschool, uh, which are not there, universal preschool of good quality, hopefully, uh, introducing uh, um, a child credit that is refundable, is that that's going to cost money, and then that is going to eventually need to to generate its own need for uh, for raising taxes. Historically, in the U.S., it has been uh, much, much, much easier to lower taxes than to raise them. Uh, so historically, uh, each uh, the Republican administration has decreased taxes, and then each subsequent Democratic administration has increased less, but has increased them not enough to even catch up to what the previous administration had done. 
which is why there is a trend after a big downward, uh, a big decrease in taxes in, in, in the Reagan administration, there is a general downward trend uh, ever since then, which led us to this very, very low, very, very low levels. And, uh, and President Biden faces the same difficulty that others are, are, are faced before him. I think with potentially a, a, a slight difference, which is now at least uh, when you poll, in polls, uh, the, uh, there is much more support than there used to be for uh, taxation of the very rich. And there used okay. to be none of it, but at least in polls. That doesn't mean that it's going to translate in, uh, in, in su sufficient political support to break through 50-50 uh, majority, but it's going in that direction. Historically, uh, and it's been easier to pass uh, in, in the US to pass measures to attack uh, ex ante in inequality uh, than to pass uh, increase in, in, in taxes. So, for example, uh, I'm actually, even though the, the, the politics is more complicated given the rules in the Senate, I'm actually more optimistic about the possibility that in many states there is a significant increase in the minimum wage in the US then real uh, significant tax reform uh, um, that we are to, to, un, to more than undo what was done in the Trump administration. Okay, so we have um, a few minutes uh, left before the um, uh, end of this session, and I will be happy to ask you uh, very shortly as a kind of introduction of uh, the next session, which will be on ecological transition, if uh, you consider that we are making any progress in the climate front. It, it will be uh, less about one minute each of you, uh, just in order to uh, have uh, your point of view on that very important field that we'll, be, uh, that we'll be discussing in the next two hours. Jean, perhaps? Well, we're, we are not making that much progress, unfortunately. Uh, we are way behind. We, do, we should do much more. Um, and we are still arguing about uh, small things when actually uh, the planet is burning. Uh, Joe Biden um, is green, but not that green again. Uh, so that's what's good news with the election of Joe Biden. He's going Poor to Joe Biden, and Joe Biden is, <laughs> but. <laughs> but yes, yes. Yeah, but he, actually, the, his R&D program is good. So he's going to put a lot of money into green R&D, into electric cars into reinforcing the power grid so that you can basically move the electricity produced from renewables and so on. So that's good. But it's still keeping all the subsidies for the fossil fuels and the gas guzzler, so people who commute long distance still in their SUVs, the big uh, shopping malls, the, uh, you know, with AC, the big houses and so on and so forth. And, you know, the incentives through a carbon price uh, to change the production mix in favor of carbon-free uh, power and, and production processes is not there. So, yeah, I mean, could look better. Okay. Uh, Abhijit? I think that the key, key thing that is not in much of the conversation, especially in the U.S., is in the end, if we want COP26, which is coming up, to be a success, we need to compensate poor countries. I think poor countries are will need to be paid some money to do what they need to do, uh, because I mean they will otherwise feel that you know this the big problem was caused by rich countries overconsuming, and why should they pay for it? The compensation should be is both morally and. I think, uh, from an economic point of view, entirely rational. But w would it happen? Given nobody, nobody seems to be talking about big monies to be transferred through the COP26 process. That sort of, to me, to me, the big, big um, sort of concern of the moment, just as we lead into it, is who's going to put up the money for those uh, those uh, transitions that are need to happen. The air conditioners in India that are creating every kind of uh, of environmental uh, cost how ca how can we get those out and replace them by much more efficient ones for example and i think that that's where money will be have to be put on the line and the last word will be uh, 
uh, for Esther. So uh, in about a minute on this huge subject, I'm sorry. Yes, so I'll tell you what I just said to the vaccine conversation. I think if we fail to find 50 billion to vaccinate the world, we, have, we would have demonstrated such pathetic uh, global leadership that I think we are going to pay dearly uh, in that COP26 summit. Because today, if I was a, a president in the developing countries, and if I had received enough vac COVAX doses to vaccinate three people, I would say, come on, give me a break. Like, this conversation is not serious. Okay. Um, that's um, uh, so, yeah, we can read it. <laughs> okay, we are sorry we have to, con to, to finish now. And uh, um, thank you very much, all of you, uh, to have joined us for this uh, hour together. And uh, we appreciate really to have both of you. And uh, we hope, as Jean said, perhaps uh, to uh, see you next year, but it will be that time in Toulouse. Thank you very much, all of you. We'll okay. be happy. Okay.